Welcome to the Intentional Encourager podcast, where each episode brings you compelling conversations and stories designed to entertain, enlighten, and encourage. And now here's your host, Brian Sexton. And welcome into the Intentional Encourager podcast. I'm your host, Brian Sexton. Thank you for joining us again today. I have an unbelievably fascinating gentleman with me on the podcast. He is a clinical research professor at George Washington University. He is the author of the book, Not For Long, The Life and Career of the NFL Athlete. Oh, by the way, he's a former NFL athlete. If, if that book title did not give that away, and it is an honor, you can go to his website at robertturnerphd.com, but right now you can find him right here on the Intentional Encourager podcast, and that is my guest, Dr. Robert Turner. Dr. Turner, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, and I'm, it's a real honor and a ple- uh, privilege for me to be here. Thank you for looking me up and, and giving me this opportunity, and I just want to say hello to everybody out there, who, and I hope that, uh, again, pray that people will find something meaningful out of this today. Absolutely. Let's start here, and, and, and I want to start here because I've started here just about every podcast because the last 20, 21 months or so, and we've, we launched this podcast in April of 2020, right as the pandemic was starting. And so I want to get a perspective of of how things have been for you professionally, personally, the last 21 months or so, because everybody has had a different outlook. Everybody's had a different situation. Living in West Virginia, certainly the pandemic was much different for us than it was in folks in larger cities. Even even across the globe, as I've talked to people, everyone's had a different experience. Dr. Turner, take me through the experiences you've had the last 20 or 21 months. And what's one lesson that you have learned through this time that you will carry with you after the pandemic is over? Oh, well, so, you know, we could probably with that, probably spend the whole podcast just on that alone, because I think. It's- no, we're going to save some time to talk football. I mean, that, that we're going to save some time because that that is. And, and folks, if you've listened to the podcast, you know, I'm a big sports guy. And so that the, the but but we'll, we will weave that in a little bit later in the conversation. But but how what lesson will you take from the last 20 or 21 months after um, this is all over? I think that the, the biggest lesson that I have learned in the last 20, 21 months, especially working with, you know, my students in the university, people have all kinds of people deal with adversity in many different ways. Right. What's stressful for some people is is it something that they can actually cruise, other people can cruise through. I think what, what I've learned is to try to your very best meet people where they are, right? Really kind of meet people with a, with a lot of respect and compassion. You never know what another person is going through, right? And so to the extent that you can be, you know, just someone like a brother to lean on, a shoulder, just to say a kind word to someone, to be there to pick someone up wherever they may be, as well as I think is also really, really important that, you know, you recognize that no person is an island unto themselves. And then when other people are trying to reach out to to give you a hand or give you support or show you some love, you know, open up your heart, open up your eyes and be willing to accept the blessings that other people are willing to give you as well. So I yeah. think, you know, having a two way street is really, really important. So compassion, love, caring for other people and recognizing that, you know, if, if you just reach out and extend to another person, regardless of whether they're like you or different from you or not, we all are human beings. We all want, need love. We all need encouragement. We all need support. And so be that bridge to someone else at some time. That's what I've learned, kind of kind of really the long and short of it uh, is the lesson. The thing that I've had to go through during the pandemic, I'm, I'm single. I don't have children. So um, 
I've been very fortunate. I, I move. I live in a very nice place, um, both my physically here as well as the community and the neighborhood that I, I live in. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, in terms of stressful situation, COVID wasn't that stressful for me. I, I have a very good, strong environment around me and good family and everything else. Um, so I was very fortunate, but I had to learn. Like I have some friends that have young kids and I, and I didn't know what it was like when people you know, we're trying to both parents being home and all the kids are young and one of them is in school, one of them is, is a toddler and all of those challenges, right? So I, re I recognized from some of my friends that, hey, that, that was their level uh, of struggle. I had some other friends who lived alone on their own, but they, the isolation being away from other people was really, really difficult. And I would have to say that a lot of other people, um, they were really impacted by George Floyd's situation, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you have yeah. racial dynamics that were in the country. And I happen to live in Washington, D.C., right? So the, the, the political hub, right? You had, you had the insurrection. You have, you have all of these things. Like the one thing I learned about D.C., not, not being a native from here, is where everybody else, the common thing that you talk about that, that, that is, you know, you talk about weather and you talk about sports. In D.C., everybody talks about sports politics right yeah no what side of the aisle you're on politics it runs everything in this town right so that makes it for a really intricate dance on how that happens so these are the probably the reasons that i've had to learn that you know really is about how how can you really kind of love someone and allow other people to love you and try to find commonalities instead of differences i think that's what we really need to focus you on. you know i've had to reacclimate myself to uh, and and as we record this, if you notice a little bit different, look to the podcast. I'm actually traveling as we record this podcast. I'm very close to where Dr. Turner is, and here's what I here's what I had to reacclimate myself to D.C. I don't know how in the world you guys deal with this traffic. I I have no idea because again, where I live. In West Virginia, I live in an area probably of about 100,000 people. We get on the interstate and we just go. And I programmed an address into my GPS that was 40 miles away, but it took me an hour and 15 minutes to get there. And so I don't know how you deal with the traffic in this area. And so if somebody's listening that lives in the Northern Virginia, Maryland area, I do not mean to be offensive. But I, I, could, I just could not deal with this traffic. Well, my, my solution is very simple. I don't even own a car. I'm, I'm from up north. I'm from Jersey, and, and I went to graduate school in New York. So I'm a real advocate on public transportation. I'm on the bus. I'm on the metro. And people say to me all the time, how do you make it without a car? I actually walk to my grocery store. I, I, I take the whole European approach. I buy the groceries on a daily basis that I need. And so it really keeps my stress level down a lot because I probably am not out there on that mixing bowl uh, dealing with all of that traffic. But you're, I've heard nightmares and my sister has to deal with it. So it's tough for a lot of people, but I, I, my solution is to take uh, public transportation. Well, no, and, and again, um, beautiful area. Northern Virginia has so much history and, and D.C. and things like that, and the, the traffic is just not for me. Let, me. let me go here with you for just a second. You know, being of last year in the NFL was so different. It was, um, and, and being a Cincinnati Bengals fan, they kind of hid, a, not hid, but they kept the third string quarterback in a hotel away from the team because of COVID. And when Joe Burrow got hurt, ironically, against the, the Washington football team, then, then they brought Brandon Allen from the hotel and put him into the same protocols and things like that. But they basically stashed their practice squad quarterback away from the team. Last year was so different, playing in empty stadiums and all the you know games getting moved from Sunday to Monday. Pittsburgh and Baltimore played a Wednesday afternoon game. Going back a little bit to your time as a professional athlete, I want to go here for a minute because, again, we saw athletics just turned upside down in the last year, and we're finally getting some normalcy. How do you think 
the NFL athlete when you played, how would you guys have dealt with what guys last year had to deal with? And even this year where guys are missing games because of safety and health protocols where they might feel fine, you know, or guys used to play with the flu, you know, quarterbacks have, you know, and, and you know, quarterbacks, defensive linemen, running backs have played with, with fevers and temperatures because it was just what you did back then. It's just, you, you just gutted through it. How do you think it would have been when you played in the NFL under these COVID situations that the athlete from last year had to deal with and even this year? Well, you ask a great question and I'm going to, I'm going to s- slightly move it in another direction. I'll answer sure, go ahead. I, yes, please. Direction. You know, cause again, right. So I've had a, the fortune, you know, really been blessed uh, to have played. I studied a lot of athletes. I spent a lot of time with athletes and you know, the thing about the NFL in a, in a certain respect, and on the one hand, it, you know, moving into the COVID during the COVID time in a, in one respect, wasn't that big of a deal because you practice and you practice all the time in front of nobody. And so, you know, you go out there and yes, you do play in empty stadiums and you make that adjustments and that's really difficult. But on the other hand, they, they're getting paid for a living. That's a job in a certain respect. And you understand that the thing about the NFL that is so different from high school and the college, it, it literally is a business. You, have, you get paid to perform. If you don't perform, you're not there. So whether the fans are a lot of fans in the stadium or there's a few fans in the stadium, they're always, what I always say, and one of the reasons is the book is entitled, and you probably have heard, you know, the famous, it was, I think it was Bum Phillips that had said, the NFL stands for not for long because one of the things about the NFL is that the moment that they that you get drafted and you sign your contract, there there are scouts committed to finding your replacement, right? So that that literally is what they're always trying to do is how do we improve our team? So it doesn't matter whether there are fans in the stadium or there are no fans in the stadium. They're always thinking about how do we, like there is no job safety. People say within the NFL, you've got like your job safety is in six second in- increments because if you get hurt at any given time, then they're you know they're obligated to find someone else. It's not like basketball. It's not like baseball there's relatively few guaranteed contracts so you know your mindset in in football is every day you go to work you're there to perform rather there and of course you feed off of people in the stands and everything else but it is an intense environment that you have to learn how to deal with that pressure all the time but what i was saying is what i where i have really seen in sports that COVID was really tough was in particular For high schoolers, adolescents, young people, it was very difficult for college students because, again, but if you think about COVID for high school students, they're all trying to get to the next level. But yet, if you're not being able to perform and you don't know when you can perform, you don't know when you can see your friends and you're isolated, it's really, really difficult. And so I I felt my heart really goes out to the coaches, the families, the players that had to play through COVID. And then now we're just finally this year getting back together. That adjustment has been tough for them and it's going to linger for a while. I love that. Let's take a quick break. And and I want to piggyback when we come back, I want to piggyback off of that conversation because I don't think a lot of people, Dr. Turner, realize the sacrifices that these young men and women make to go to from high school to college and to to continue their athletic career and then the small percentage that get to move on and play professionally so when we come back i want to dive into that a little bit more i also want to talk about the study that you're doing studying brain health and and the effect of that on athletes that especially in 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 sports like football that have violent collisions and things like that We're going to get into that. My guest, Dr. Robert Turner, joins me on the Intentional Encourager podcast back in just a moment. Hey, everybody. Brian Sexton here. I want to tell you about our sponsor, SEO National. SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. Now, what's that, you might say? Well, Search Engine Optimization helps you show up higher on search engines 
in front of paying customers for words that you as a business owner can monetize. What a great concept. SEO National is owned by my good buddy, Damon Burton, who's been a guest here on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Not only has Damon and his team worked with businesses of all sizes, from e-commerce startups to NBA teams and Shark Tank featured businesses, but more importantly, Damon and his team are about transparency, trust, and providing lifetime value. So much so that he still has his first customers after opening SEO National 14 years ago. Let me give you some intentional encouragement and call Damon and his team today at 855-736-6285 or go to www.seonational.com and get a free quote. Dr. Turner, I love what you said before the break about who this pandemic has, has really affected in athletics and and i think for a minute about those kids in 2020 who did not you know because again the pandemic happened in in march right in the midst of high school basketball season we had and i'm reminded of a team that we had locally that was in the midst of an undefeated season and their season just got halted they were going to make a run to a state championship high school baseball Again, those, those, those athletes that were seniors in high school in 2020 that had their seasons wiped out and the effects that it had on them. When you think about your journey from high school to college to the NFL, and you mention that, what is one thing that most people don't understand about the journey and the, and the sacrifice that it takes. Because we just see folks, we see these athletes on Saturdays and Sundays. If they're, if these young men and women are able to go from high school to college, then they'll play on Saturday. You know, or, or you know, in, in, in the NFL's case, you get to play on Sunday. Or, or if you join the WNBA, if you're fortunate enough, you play during the week. But what's the one thing most people don't realize about the, the, what it takes to jump from level to level and ultimately get to the professional level. Oh, wow. Well, so I think here's what I think on the high school level, the thing that makes it so very difficult, right? Believe it or not. And we've maybe people have heard this before, but, but I think we've, we've moved ourselves into a culture. And, 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 and remember, I say this with the caveat that, sports for me really worked. If it, I mean, I was fortunate. I went from, you know, high school to college. Sports got a full scholarship in college. And then from that, I, I wound up getting a PhD because of the fact that I play sports and what I'm able to study. And I have a whole career around this. But, it, but I was one of, one of the fortunate ones. The real challenge that I think that we present to young people today is that we don't have a lot of space in sports for people to pursue the game just because they, they purely love it. They're, it's highly competitive. And so just to make, like, we have all of these travel teams now in AAU, we have in basketball, you have, you know, even if you're playing field hockey, you got to be on a travel team. You're playing soccer, you're playing volleyball, you're playing football, you got to be on seven on seven. You basically have to be an athlete all year round, just to even be able to play on your varsity team. Yes. And then if you have aspirations to go on to college, you're really thinking, are the scouts seeing me? Do I, am I, do I have a high of profile on online are people following me on twitter are they doing this are they doing all of that how are they ever going to see me and then you take that into to, to covid and these kids that were sophomores and juniors and covid hit and they're now seniors or maybe they're in high they're like how am i going to get this exposure and then you have put on top of that you have some of these these parents who dr turner it, can, it, can i jump in for just a second because you're really you're really going to a phenomenal place here. And I love this. And, and what, what I wanted to jump in with is I, I want to kind of take what you said and apply the lens of your current role, what you do now. Do you feel like, because I, I see what you're talking about with, with all the things that young people do today to get noticed all the different tools out there that weren't available 30 years ago. 
to, to get you to the next level. I mean, really, 30, 35 years ago, you had to, to be fortunate enough to, for somebody to find you, for somebody to see you. If we look back, if we look ahead 20 years from now, and as folks study the effects of this pandemic, now I want to go here from a research perspective and, and really dive into what you're doing now. How will we research what you're talking about? And how will the lens of history research the effects of, of, of the pandemic and what was lost and what might have been? How will the lens of history help us study that? And, and how can we pull lessons from that as we study it going forward? I hope I've asked that question correctly because in my mind, Whenever you take something from someone, there is an adverse effect that happens, whether it's repressed mentally or whether at some point it's dealt with because all of us deal with loss in different ways. And you talk about in your book, the transition from, you know, from being on the Sunday spotlight to, to now not moving, you know, not having that adrenaline, not having that, that juice. How will the lens of history help us understand what was truly lost by these young people in the last year? Well, I'm going to try my best to take a very positive outlook on it, but I, I have to tell you that I'm a little skeptical, and here's the reason why. So what I hope that history will tell us is that when it what, through COVID is that these young people, one, they cannot be isolated. They really need social support. They really need you know, think about when you were a kid and you're an adolescent, you're trying to figure out what you're trying to do in your life. Like being on a team, be, having friends, being able to see your friends every day, having that, even though we know kids spend a lot of time on, uh, you know, like uh, social media and a lot of time playing video games, they still need to be around each other, right? They, you know, yep. they need to know that they really matter. And that isolation, we've seen a lot of anxiety and stress. So I hope that what we learn from this, both from athletes and non-athletes, is that we need to provide social support systems for mental health, anxiety, stress, and depression. We really need to, uh, the grown-ups in the room really need to keep an eye on that. We need to figure out when people are at most at risk and make sure that we provide those resources for them, not just giving lift, lip service to it. That's what I hope that history will show us in 20 years from now, is that if anything is taught us, it's a wake up call to really pay attention to young people because navigating that time in their life is very difficult. And we need, as adults, we need to really be able to be there for them. That's what I hope. Now, yeah. now let me just say from a sports perspective where I'm cynical or less than optimistic, right? I think that what we're what history is going to tell us is this whole change from name, image, and likeness that we see on the college level is going to push down 20, 10, 5, 10 years from now into the high school level. And we're going to see young people under that pressure of not only today, it's about do I get to become the um, the quarterback of Michigan? You remember a couple of years ago, Jim Harbaugh gave an eighth grader a scholarship to play quarterback for Michigan. I don't know whatever happened to that, but it was a big announcement in the news. You are now going to see very soon eighth graders saying, I deserve, I'm the number one ranked guy in my basketball, football, tennis, or whatever. Yeah. I want my name, image, and likeness. And parents are going to say, hey, my kid needs to get paid, which I think is a is something that we really need to get a handle on this because I think that ultimately – while the short-term gain is they might see some money, long-term, I'm worried about the, you know, the emotional, mental, physical um, detriment that these, these kids might have to go through. I love what you, I love where this conversation is going. And I want to take it and expand it just for a minute because you've really hit on something that, that happens in – and, and, and I had a guest on the, the Intentional Encourager podcast, Ed Lattimore, that talked about basically the, the dopamine effect of social engagement, social media engagement, and what you were just talking about. The eighth grader that is, I'm the number one player in the country. People are fawning over me. College coaches, you know, as, as freshmen and sophomores in high school are coming to see these kids. 
and, and, and coaches like John Calipari of Kentucky and Coach K at Duke are, are coming to their high school gym. And now all of a sudden they're, they're there to see them and they're, they're, they're now coming into the home and we want, you know, I, I, and, and now announcing where you're going to go to school is getting you on sports center where you're going to go to, where you're going to play your college football or basketball, gets you on sports center. How will we, st- and again, forgive me for going here, but this is where I'm thinking about is, and I'm going to get into your, your study, your brain study in, in just a moment, but how do we study what is happening internally in the minds of these young people and the need for them to have that constant crave of attention, that constant need to be, if I'm not the number one player in my class, or I'm not the number one player, or, you know, how many colleges are coming after me? You mentioned name, image, and likeness. It was all driven by the the need of the college athlete to go, I'm going to get mine, and I'm going to leave. If I have to leave school after my freshman year, I'm going to get mine because I can't go to the NBA right out of high school anymore. I can't go to the NFL right out of high school. I have to wait three years to go to the NFL. How will we study, or or how can we study the effects of those type of reinforcements mentally? in the minds of these kids and what can we do to help them balance themselves better so that the expectations when they when they don't happen let's say they get hurt let's say it doesn't work out the way it's supposed to how do we keep them from from just not going off a cliff mentally when some of these things that they that have been used to don't materialize because you know athletics better than anybody Dr. Turner guys don't play forever and guys get cut, and great players get cut, and there's a day and time when it's all over. How do we temp? How do we keep the expectations, and how do we help condition the mind to those expectations, to where we don't have these tragic stories, where some of these athletes just go out careening off the cliff when it doesn't work out. Well, I think the question that you're asking again is a very important question but I think it's a matter of perspective of how you approach it. I'm a sociologist. I think, I think on, on the more of the micro and the meso level and then how this impacts on, you know, the individual, you know, kind of level. And I, I think what you're raising is more of a structural problem. But then w- when we see a large sy- systemic structural problem, what we tend to do is we look at how do we make individual behavioral changes for that structural problem. But if the problem is on the larger level, only but so much is going to happen on the individual level to, to really adjust to this. What I, I really believe is part of the bigger issue that we're talking about here is, again, is the adults in the room have created a structure. They've created a system that literally we now look at and we treat youth sports. I mean, even down to little league sports, right? We treat high school sports as though they are professionals well before they're equipped to deal with all that we expose them to. Like right now, we, you know, we've all seen the, you know, the movie and the book, uh, Saturday, you know, Friday Night Lights, right? But it's realistic. Every Friday, you can turn on ESPN and there's a high school featured game and there's all ESPN one, two, three. So there's high schools all over the country getting exposure. They're wearing jerseys and different uniforms, different matching of their uniforms, the same way that colleges and the pros are. So how would we not expect young people? people that already believe that I play for this school, I threw for this amount of yards, or I scored this many goals, why wouldn't they see themselves as the second coming of LeBron James or anything else? Yeah, Dr. Turner, I love that that response. That was so good. Let's step aside, take a break. When we come back, Dr. Turner is doing some very important work with studying athletes and we've all heard about the concussion issues and player safety in pro and college and even down to the high school level with sports and so again i want to make sure that we save time and room to talk about that the work that he is doing as well as i want to talk about his life 
transitioning from the NFL to academia. Folks, you, you very rarely see athletes transition to academia the way that Dr. Robert Turner has done it. And so let's step aside, take a break. We want to leave room and space to talk about those things. My guest, Dr. Robert Turner, joining me on the Intentional Encourager podcast back in a moment. Hey everybody, Brian Sexton here. We are in the season of gift giving. Everywhere you go, whether you go to a store, you go online, the gifts are out to be gotten. I've got a gift idea for you I think you're going to love. It's my book, People Buy From People. Ten powerful people lessons from the ultimate people person, my dad. If you know someone that would love to be a better connector, or you want to help them get there, People Buy From People is for them. Leaders, if you've got teams that you want to connect better, deeper, powerful, both internally and externally, People Buy From People is for them. If you want to connect like you've never connected before, pick up a copy of People Buy From People. You might say, Brian, where do I get a copy? Very simple. Go to Amazon.com, search People Buy From People, Brian Sexton. You'll find it right there. There's also a Kindle version available and an Audible version read by me. Let me give you some intentional encouragement and go today, get your copy, People Buy From People. I promise you, you won't regret it. And now let's get back to more great conversation here on the Intentional Courage Podcast. Dr. Turner, now I've been, I've been teasing this the whole podcast. You are doing some important work right now. You're doing a study on the effects of, of violent concussion and forgive me if, if I'm getting this incorrect but you're doing some studies on on the the violence of athletics upon the brain and how that it impacts the brain what prompted you to take your research in this direction was there a light bulb moment because we've seen the Will Smith movie where he plays the the Boston neurologist we've heard a lot if you follow pro sports about CTE, about studying the brains of athletes who have passed away. One, two that, that particularly come to mind are Mike Webster, the Hall of Fame center from the Pittsburgh Steelers, and Dave Duerson, the former defensive back of the Chicago Bears. Those are two that, that really come to mind quickly when, when I hear the term CTE. What prompted you to start to study the effects of these, these type of violent collisions year after year on the human brain? Okay, well, again, I really appreciate you asking the question. Let me start by saying this, right? Because this is a really important distinction that, that I, I want people, if they don't hear anything else, I, I really want them to understand this. That, there, that CTE is one thing and concussions are a different thing. So concussions are about brain injury. It's a, traumatic, a mild traumatic brain injury. And so there's the impact of brain injuries on the long-term effects of your brain, right? That's one thing. CTE, on the other hand, is a neurodegenerative disease, mm -hmm. which is similar to Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, you know, Lewy body's dementia, cardiovascular dementia. That is a, the, the, the brain is diseased in a neurodegenerative state. And what, we're learned, what we've learned is that those are two separate different ways. One goes on the highway to the left and one goes to the highway to the, the right. There's, they're different. What I started, and, and I'm, I'm really interested in, although I do studies in both of those areas because I really want to understand the risks associated with you know, um, long-term imp impact of cognitive aging on, on the brain and playing sports right, both the risk and protective factors. But what really started me was when I was writing my book and I was in graduate school, a couple of things happened. One, it was right at the time that Dave Duerson, um, you know, uh, towards the later part, but Dave Duerson had committed suicide. But it was when, in, in particular, when, when Junior Seau had done this. And, and at that time I had been interviewing, I, for my book, I interviewed 140 athletes and I lived with athletes. I spent a lot of time with them. It was, I was in the field for four years interacting with athletes athletes all the time. And one of the things that really caught my attention was that the people around Junior Seau, if they, you talk to them all, no one recognized the symptoms or the signs that he was going through prior to him 
you know, committing suicide. And then looking back, everybody said, oh man, how did I miss these? And those kinds of things. I had Rodney Pete on one of my um, webinars and Rodney said, I, I played ball in college with Junior and we were in, in the NFL for a long period of time. I talked to him a week before he committed suicide and nobody saw it. Dr. Turner, can I can I jump in here? You, you make a great point because Rodney Pete had a long career as an NFL quarterback. And we look at the position of quarterback today in the NFL, and, and here's where I want to go with this. Junior Seau was a middle linebacker, a Hall of Fame middle linebacker. The argument could be made, well, Junior Seau was delivering a lot of punishment. But Rodney Pete played a position that by its very nature gets punishment almost on every play with the exception of, a, of an offensive lineman or a running back. And, but in the NFL game, we don't protect linemen the same way we protect quarterbacks. There isn't a, a, a personal foul penalty for roughing the left tackle, but there is a personal foul penalty if there's a helmet-to-helmet -helmet shot on the quarterback or there's a late hit on the quarterback. Is it? I, I, and Rodney Pete seemingly has a normal, healthy life and he played at the same time and played not as long as Junior Seau played. Actually, but, I think he played longer. He yeah, played ex you, exactly. But but I, here's where I'm going with this. Why don't we see more of these brain injuries that happen to quarterbacks that, that you know, you're hearing about, like you mentioned, like Dave Duerson, a defensive back, Junior Seau, a middle linebacker. I mentioned Mike Webster, an offensive lineman. Why don't we see more of these things happening to the quarterback position who tends to take those hits, but we, we tend to see more of these things happening with non-quarterback positions. You don't see a lot of it happening with running backs or wide receivers. Why do you think it's, it's more, it, it seems to be skewed more to the defensive side of the ball than it does the offensive? I, am, I, am I reading into something there that's not there? Well, I, I think you're asking again important questions, but I do think that you know from what we've seen, the evidence bears out a little bit different than what you're talking about because okay. we're talking about a couple different things, right? For one, historically, we have to put things in historical context, right? Historically, the NFL did a very, very poor job of actually identifying, recognizing, and diagnosing um, concussions. In fact, for the for the longest period of time, and even today, there's still a uh, debate. Um, as to what constitutes an actual concussion, right? We know that when you lose loss of consciousness and you're knocked out, that's a concussion. But, you know, the question is how many, how do we actually testify and how do we know how many concussions? And historically, we really don't know. We ask people, and I do this all the time in my studies, we've had people, I played 16 years between junior high school, high school, college, and the pros. I've never had a concussion. I've never been diagnosed with a concussion. And as far as I know, I've never had some symptoms of a concussion, but that's not to say I never had one because I was not, I was not diagnosed, right? So, and then what we found in the, many of our particular studies, we found that there is no one position that actually makes it um, more prone to concussions or not. You know, there, there, you know, again, that's up for debate. The question around the CTE thing is what they're seeing is more repetitive head impacts which is different than and what started my study started was looking at, I had a couple of athletes tell me that they had been depressed while they were playing sports. And I thought to myself, how in the world can you play at such a high level and have gone through depression? So that started making me think about mental health issues, right? And what I learned in the, in the research is, a, in whether you play sports or not, about 85% of people who have any type of concussion, mild tra traumatic brain injury, sports concussion, 85% within two weeks to up to about three months, they go back to baseline. There are no impact, negative impacts on your brain for a concussion, even when you've had multiple concussions. But there's about 15% that are in that acute phase that it then doesn't go back to baseline, it becomes chronic problems associated with that. So there's something physiologically that we wanted to figure out what's going on. Like what protects the largest 85% and then what makes that 15% more at risk and exposed to that? So I was thinking to myself, there's lots of football players, myself included, that played a long time, God willing, that have never had any kind of impact, 
negative impacts from concussions or memory loss or long-term effects of like that. But then there are some other things. So is it a physiological thing? Is it the way that we're treating injury? Or is it there's something about some people that make them more resilient than others? That's what I'm trying to find out with my particular study. Here's what I believe is so fascinating, Dr. Turner, is that every, and I've said this about myself and in, in relationship to, to other things, everybody's body is different. It's why you see these, you know, and I'll say this. It's why I believe you will, you probably will not ever see another Bo Jackson. Because, I mean, again, you the, the, the just the power and speed. And, and I try to tell my 21-year-old son about a guy like Bo Jackson. And it's hard for me to describe because Bo Jackson, to me, could have played in any era. Bo Jackson would be a 1,500-yard to 2,000 yard back today in today's NFL. That's how special and rare of a talent that he was. And you think, okay, these guys come into the league, they're bigger, faster, stronger. You look at Rob Gronkowski basically redefining the tight end position with how physically imposing he is. We've gone from the quarterback position, guys being 5'11 to 6 feet. Then there was a run where we wanted 6'5", six, 6'6 six, six guys to stand in the pocket because they could see over top of the defense. Now we want, we're going back to that small, quicker, get the ball out of your hands type of thing. As football evolves, what is the one thing that's going to remain constant about the NFL athlete? Because you mentioned when you're talking to people and interacting with athletes, they're saying, I just don't feel right. You know, I, I was, you know, I got a concussion and, and, I, and I started suffering depression and things like that. Is there one constant that you have found in all of the guys that you've studied that have played NFL football? What is that one thing that's constant among all 140 that you talk about in the book? Well, it's the thing that's really constant is not about the physical, it's the mental. The mental that it takes to play professional sports. I don't know about other sports, I have not interviewed those other people, but the mentality that it takes to play in the NFL at a high level is amazing. Th these people, their minds, their, their ability to push through at all costs, it's amazing mentally where these people's lives and where their where their heads are. My nephew right now is, and, and it's funny because I know you're a Cincinnati fan. My nephew is a tight end at um, the University of Nevada at Reno, and he's uh, led the nation as a tight end uh, with in touchdown receptions this year. And he's you know slated to be drafted. And they on some of the boards they have him as someone that the Cincinnati is very interested in. Yeah. I, I've watched his I watched his transformation. His name is Cole Turner. I've watched him and I knew when he had it because the guy is very physically um talented. But just hanging out with him, talking to him, I see where his focus is and his level of confidence and how he believes in himself. That's what it takes to be able to go amongst the best athletes in the world and believe that you are better than everybody else. The mental aspect of the game is unbelievable. I've got to ask you this. If you could step back in time, knowing what you know now, and you could go back and, and have a conversation with Robert Turner, defensive back for the San Francisco 49ers, and you could interview yourself as one of these 140 athletes that you talked about in the book. What do you think that conversation would be like with you 25 or 30 years ago? And how, do you, how would you counsel yourself if you could step back and, and, and have that conversation with yourself 25, 30 years ago? I think if I were, for one, I, I would have realized, talking to myself at that point, looking back, I realized that I had, things had happened so fast, your career is so short, they happen so fast that you don't even actually recognize what's going on in your life at that time. You're doing the best that you can to move through this and enjoy it and the whole bit, but it, it, it the door opens and it closes so quickly that you have no idea what you're actually 
experience it. <laughs> that would be the number one thing that I would, I would really try to help my young, younger self understand it. And I, and I also think that as much as talented as I was as an athlete and as hard as I really pushed, I don't think that I really tapped into my potential. I had no idea of how much potential or what it took to tap into my full potential. Now, it's very unfair to say that though, because we don't have anywhere near the training methods we didn't have back then that we had that. I mean, back then you were, we literally had an off season. There is no off season right now. You have to treat yourself in a certain way. I really wish, I look at them in envy in some of the ways that the young people today have these training methods, have these resources available to me, to them. I would have absolutely loved and enjoyed that. I wish I would have had personal coaching to push me as far as I possibly could. I don't regret it. Don't wish that I was back there anymore. I live vicariously through my nephew. But I, but I, I really, you know, you have such a small point in time to play sports. And everybody says you have to be prepared for something else when this window closes. I tell my young people that I'm with all the time now that play sports, be a, re a renaissance man, be a renaissance woman. Be great at everything you do. Because what I've learned as an adult looking back in my career is I realized that the things that I do have today is it taught me how to work. It taught me how to push, how to overcome adversity. It taught me to have a really high level of confidence in myself and believe you know, that I have a purpose. And so when I'm doing something with a purpose, I know that I will always win win because I know how to win. I've learned how to win before. And so with my research, I realized that I pull a team around me. I lead that team. I expect excellence from them and I want them to help push me because we have a purpose of trying to find answers for the people that we serve in doing our research. You are a part of one of the greatest dynasties in NFL history in, in the 1980 San Francisco 49ers. A real small part. Yeah. I was only there for a minute. But, but, but well, but, but again, those that know those of us that know pro football will know the names Joe Montana, Ronnie Lott. I could even go Steve Young. I could go a little bit deeper. Uh, there was a guy there in the mid '80s, Keena Turner. Absolutely. You know now, right? Uh, I, 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 you know, and even going a little bit further than that, Ken Norton Jr. had some time with the 49ers. Deion Sanders, again, that Charles Haley. We Charles Haley, yeah, a guy has seven. A guy has been, you know, he, he won. I think starting team on five Super Bowls. Five Super Bowls, yeah. You know, he had the record for Super Bowls until Brady came along with with, exactly. with Tom Brady came along with his great talented players in that what was harder for you getting your phd or making it to the nfl oh that's a great question i just had a conversation i and um um julius thomas who played you know great tight end played on the denver teams with um, peyton manning and he's now pursuing his phd in clinical psychology and he said to me he said I thought, you know, here I am a pro athlete. He says, I made a lot of money through my, my career. He goes, I had no idea it was so hard to get a PhD. <laughs> well, think about what the, 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 the um, and he was just traded from the Chiefs. I think he was traded to the Giants. Um, Duvernay Tardif, he was a, an offensive guard who got his medical degree, who, who got his medical doctorate um, a, a couple of years ago as an active member of the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, granted, he got it in Canada because he was Canadian, right, right, but still, right. I mean, incredible to, to do that. You know, and, and Julius Thomas, an all-pro tight end, as, as you mentioned. Well, take me through the driving force in for you because you, you got to the pinnacle of your athletic career. Even even just getting there, so many guys don't even get there. And now all of a sudden you go and you say, okay, I want to get a PhD, which by the way, I have an MBA. I have no desire to get a PhD because I know the work and the sacrifice it would take. And people have asked me, are you going to go? No, absolutely not. I admire men, men and women like yourself that go to that next level and get their PhD. But what was the driving force? Was it, was it trying to find a, a purpose after playing pro football that pushed you to get your PhD? What was... Take me behind the thought process and the impetus of getting that, that PhD. 
I, I wish it was, you know, as sophisticated as that. But in my instance, it's really about ignorance is bliss. I really didn't have any idea what it would take to actually pursue a PhD. I was, um, I, you know, I, I found this thing called sociology, and my initial purpose, I really, my plan was to actually. Um, to go get a master's degree. But then I, and I, cause I wanted to work full time and go to school full time. And I thought that that would be, you know, sufficient for what I wanted. But then I started realizing going online and doing some research and everything. And I said, well, you really can't develop a career leveraging a uh, master's in sociology and much, right? So I said, ah, oh, well, I just made the decision. I said, well, then I guess I'll just go and get a PhD. And so that was what I did. I had no idea. I didn't realize it would take me eight years. I did, again, I worked full time while I was going to school full time. But the, the driver that kept me all the way through that, because there were plenty of times that I wanted to quit. I swear I wanted to quit so many times. And my parents did, when I was young, they were like, listen, if you sign up for something, you're going to finish what you started. Like you asked to play football, you can play that one season. If you don't ever play again, that's fine. I signed up for this for a PhD. I said, okay, I'm gonna finish it. That was number one. And in those other moments that I wanted to quit, I remember very vividly in my mind thinking, I am Ruth Turner's grandson. And Ruth Turner said, you can do whatever you set your mind to. And I said, I am not disappointed in my grandmother. So I went all the way through and made sure that I got the degree. It was pretty much that simple. Well, and, and Ruth Turner is going to get to see her great grandson, hopefully play in the NFL as she, as, as hopefully she got to see her grandson, but you're right. The impact. And again, I love and, and, and just going back just a few minutes in the conversation that we had talking about young people and the expectations that they put on themselves and, you know, this this I've got to be the top recruit in the class. I've got to You know, I've got to go make bank, as the kids say, you know, and your grandmother was just like, look, you can you can be something greater than dribbling a basketball or throwing a football she really saw the long term there what do you hope in your study to pass on to future generations with with the research that you're doing and how do you see it helping current nfl athletes with with the work that you're doing first and foremost i think the work that i'm doing and we've started to see some of this changes already but you know we have to recognize that what a, what, a, what a traumatic brain injury or concussion is. It is an injury. So first of all, we have to be able to diagnose it, which they're starting to do much better. The thing that they, they're doing today better than anything else is they recognize that, that the best way to protect people from the long-term consequences of a concussion is you, it's just like any other injury. You have to let the injury heal. And that, like my nephew, again, a couple of weeks ago, he had a concussion and under normal circumstances way back in the day, they would have actually put a little smelling salt on him. How many fingers that I have? Can you stand up, walk on the sideline a little bit and go back out there? Well, yeah, they call it getting the cobwebs out of your head. Absolutely. Yeah. He just got his bell rung, right? Yeah, got your bell rung. Exactly. Right. Today's protocol, they kept him out. They realized, they looked at his baseline and they realized that the injury needs 10 days before physical activity to heal. So he missed the next game, even though he didn't want to, that was the best thing for him to let the injury heal. I think that that is a very good, important thing. I think the other thing is really important is education, empowering athletes themselves to be able to recognize and speak up when they're not feeling well, recognizing that, you know what, your long-term health is much more important than any type of short-term gratification. And then we also need to educate parents as well ask questions, get answers, make sure that you are actively involved in your child's health and your child knows how to be able to advocate for themselves and be able to speak up. Because if we don't make the game safer, right, the game's not gonna be around. And we know how important this game is for all of society. So it's incumbent upon all of us and that's why I do the work that I do, is to really make sure that we make this game as safe as possible, that we empower people, that they have the agency to speak up for themselves and get whatever treatment that they need to make sure that they can live healthy lives. Well, and, and, and football is the most popular game in our country. The, the numbers, and as we record this, I'm reminded of the stat that I heard that absolutely blew me away. The Thanksgiving Day game 
between the Dallas Cowboys and the Las Vegas Raiders was watched by 38 million people. The highest rated NBA Finals game got 36 million. Wow. wow. A Thanksgiving Day game between the Dallas Cowboys and the Las Vegas Raiders was the highest rated game the NFL had had in 31 years. And it was high, more highly rated than the NFL. So that's how much America loves the game of football. And, and I could not agree with you more. Um, as a football fan, thank you for the work that you're doing to make the game safer. Because, again, it's tragic that we don't have Junior Seau here any longer. It's tragic that we don't have Dave Dorson. Can you imagine the impact that what Junior Seau was doing in his personal life, how he was impacting his community, what Dave Dewerson was trying to do to impact his community. These men could have impacted their communities in greater ways had they been able to take care of themselves and their brains in better shape. And, and as well too, folks, mental health, if you're a business owner, please take care of your, your mental health. If, if, if you are a sales leader, Pleased at pastor, whatever, whoever's listening to this, it's so important. And, and and Dr. Turner's alluded to it. Take care of your mental health. If you've got a problem, get it taken care of. Dr. Turner, tell folks where they can get your book. I, I, I and I'm looking at the cover of this. If you go to Dr. Turner's website, RobertTurnerPhD.com, you're going to see an incredible cover to this book. Would well, tell folks where they can get your book. And, and, and tell folks, you know, again, about more, a little bit about how they can find out more about you as well and the work sure. you're doing. Well, again, the, as you can, the, really the resource for everything is, is the website that you've said. And there's a link there that takes you to the Brain Health Study. I also have a website um, that's brainhealthstudy.com. I have another website that's rwturnerlab.com so either oh, those are ways to get in touch with me academically those are ways to get in touch with the studies and then my personal website is really you know it, it talks about i was in the movie with lebron james the the um the it's, it's called student athlete well he wasn't in it he was the executive producer of it but that really led itself a lot to the name image and likeness type of thing so you can find out about you know through uh all online my twitter handle is um at uh, Robert Turner PhD as well. The book is available on at, at Amazon. It's available at Oxford University Press website or the links through my websites will take you there. Um, but again, it's all really about making sure that in particular, as you just said, we talk about pastors, we talk about businessmen. I do a lot of work on men, right? And one thing that men don't do is they don't want to speak up. They don't want to be vulnerable. They want to be strong. They want to stand up and say, hey, listen, I can take the world on, right? Because that's how we're looked at and that's how we're rewarded. But guess what? You know what? We're not invincible. We need help. We need to be able to reach out. We need to be honest. And even if it just means talking to your, your wife, your partner, your child, your teacher, your coach, anyone along the way and say, hey, you know, I'm not just quite feeling right. Can you help me find some help? That's yeah. what we're talking yeah, I love this has been so good. A different conversation today, folks, but one that has been fascinating. And Dr. Robert Turner has been my guest today on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Dr. Turner, thank you for joining me today. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. And again, I, I just thank you for the opportunity. And I really hope that, um, you know, some, somewhere out there in the universe, somebody might be able to hear this. They can always reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to help in any way I can. My thanks as always to producer Bryce Sexton and technical advisor Matt Means. And of course, the ultimate thanks goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, who provides intentional encouragement every day through his word. If you're not subscribed to the Intentional Encourager podcast, hit the subscribe button wherever you get podcasts so you don't miss an exciting episode where you can get encouraged and stay encouraged. And remember, anyone, anywhere, at any time, any place can be an intentional encourager.